writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the right path. In this episode of Right Back Radio, we're going to explore one of the great writers from the Harlem Renaissance, as well as talk about writing ordinary characters from our lives. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Back Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, author of Crazy Things, President of St. Louis Writers Guild, President of Winding Trails Media, and Martial Arts Instructor. That is what a combination. <laughs> um, anyway, and for those who have been staying on track between the rivalry between my wife and I, just to let you know, my novel is fully outlined and ready to go, so starting tomorrow... Words finally get settled down. And by the way, that's 10,000 words just in the outline. So, there we go. So, and with me today is my lovely co-host. Hello, my name is Kathleen Cayende. I write speculative fiction and romance. Um, you can find my short story, The Fairy Tree, in the Best Science Fiction and Fantasy of the Year, Volume 12. Um, my essay on Octavia Butler in Luminescent Threads, Connections to Octavia E. Butler. Um, the anthology was uh, nominated for a Hugo, which is fabulous. And, um, That's huge. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations. Um, and I was recently nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award for oh, really? my novelette, You Will Always Have Family at Triptych. So um, I'm going to ReaderCon this year for the award ceremony to see how everything goes down. So if you see me there, say hi. Okay, mm-hmm. let me just pause before we go on. I am extremely proud of you. We all are. Yes. So, and also with us today, we're going to have a little conversation off mic. But also with us today is the one and only. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chanel Etienne. I write literary fiction and speculative fiction and sometimes combinations of both. Um, I am going to be a grad student working on an MFA in creative writing. And where are you going again? University of New Orleans. We're mm-hmm. going to miss her having being here in the actual studio, but she is going to be joining online, hint, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting her off the hook. <laughs> also with us today is my lovely wife. Hi, I'm Melanie Lucas, and I will say I have worked on my novel this week. Unfortunately, the conclusion I've come to is I need to rewrite chapters one basically and going on from there so one two and probably three so if anything i feel like i'm going backwards okay so now are you done with your rough draft or is it second and second draft now or no no that's the problem i'm not done i i was going to uh just keep going with the first draft until i got done with it but i just realized there were issues with the first draft so i have to Well, I don't have to, I suppose, but I think it'll be better for the whole story if I just pause and write at least the notes that need to be fixed for, you know, chapters one through three. Just trying to see how supersonic I need to go with my typing. (laughs) And also with us today is... Fedora Amos. I write Victorian Whodunits, like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And I just finished the copy in it. For Have Your Ticket Punched by Frank James, which okay. will probably come out early next year. Mm-hmm. I'm also president mm-hmm. of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. Perfect. And also with us today, is coming remotely, so he's he didn't want to join us in the studio today. We're heartbroken. No, I'm, I'm hovering above you all in an airship, did you know? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm Brad Arcook. I'm the author of uh, a bunch of steampunk stuff and uh, a bunch of other stuff that's coming down the pipe. So if you're interested at all in Tales of the Beer Blade, uh, look for the first three episodes should be out in the very near future. Uh, but I'm announcing today the release of... Uh, Beyond the Iron Door, which is a uh, collection of short stories, uh, steampunk short stories, 
Uh, that you'll be able to get in print. All those stories are already available online. You can grab them all if you want. But if you want them in print in the collection, because several people have asked for that, uh, it will now be available. You can pick it up, read all the awesome stories. And there's one new one, uh, Touch the Stars, is going to be released next month. This month. Sorry, we're in June. This month. Excellent. And today we're going to talk about Langston Hughes, who was a Harlem Renaissance writer, as well as about writing about the ordinary person. So let me give you a little bit of historical background on Langston Hughes. Normally, I turn this over to either Fedora or Brad, but one of the few textbooks I've kept from my days in college was an African-American literature course because I discovered so many other writers I fell in love with I didn't know existed before that class. So Langston Hughes being one of them. So Langston Hughes, Hughes was born in 1902, died in 1967. When Langston Hughes died in 1967, his years of literary productivity had spanned almost half a century. In a sense, he was a literary phenomenon, for he was one of the first black men of literature who strove to make a productive and profitable career out of his writing. This he accomplished in spite of overwhelming obstacles faced by a black writer from the 1920s to the 1950s. He also... He was also a literary phenomenon in the sheer variety of his literary output. With the possible exception of formal literary criticism, he wrote in every genre. Throughout his four decades of literary creativity, he wrote poetry, drama, and fiction, assembled anthologies, and collaborated in the translation of many of his works. He he also found time to travel extensively, participate in, the, in somewhat complicated annual literature tours, or lecture tours, I'm sorry, and remain well-informed about everything that was taking place or about to take place on the Black Literary Rialto. Along with that, he was born, while well, he spent most of, a lot of his time in Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance, guess where he was born? Does anybody know sitting around... Okay, either Hi, Kathleen or Chanel. They both jumped that jumped so fast when they have shot. Can I take this one? Because Go ahead. Go for thank it. Thank you. If it were if it were uh someone from, from where you are from initially, no, I'll, I'll let you know. He, he was uh Joplin, Missouri. Joplin, Missouri, ding 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 ding, correct. <laughs> um I think he's got a star in uh, the loop too. Oh boy. I think so. Yeah. Okay. He spent his youth crisscrossing the mid- Middle West, first to Lawrence, Kansas, to live with his grandmother, whose husband, Sheridan Leary, had died with John Brown at Harper's Ferry. Then, after it became clear that his father and mother were permanently separated, he followed his mother to Detroit and finally to Cleveland, where he finished um, high school. And with that, I will skip over a lot. Um... Just real fast, he did get to be known. This is why um, we're talking about ordinary people. He didn't write about superheroes or heroes that we would think of. He wrote about one one of his main one of his characters he really became known for was Jesse B. Simple. It was spelled S E M P L E. And just quoting here, as soon as I find the right beginning, I don't know why this character why this. Sentence escapes my eyes every time I do it. As his character rounded and took shape during the 1950s, he developed into a sort of black everyman whose hurt, whose feet hurt, and whose subjects and verbs rarely agreed, but whose racial perceptions reflected great wisdom and depth of insight. As the anecdotes and stories about Semple welled into four volumes, Hughes was constantly able to maintain a neatly balanced characterization. At times, Semple is full of pain. At times, he is full of wise tolerance. At times, he is vocally indignant at the black man's lot. But he is never consumed by anger or overwhelmed by fear or paralyzed by racial paranoia. And with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and open the floor about writing about ordinary people and points of view. Go for it, please. All right, so um, his Wikipedia page uh, says that Hughes's poetry and fiction portrayed the lives of the working class blacks in America. 
Um, and he said, my seeking has been to explain and illuminate the Negro condition in America and obliquely that of all humankind. Um, so like he wrote, one of the other things, uh, it mentions is that people tended to write about, you know, if it was going to be about black people, it was about middle class black people. Um, and he was like, no, I'm going to talk about working class black people and, uh, lower class people. And, you know, I want to change how people think about us in our lives. Um, his, uh, his father was black, um, mixed ancestry, but, um, both of those, I think both his parents were. Yeah. Like he had two black grandmothers and two white grandfathers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, his, his father was not a fan of black people. He had internalized a lot of racism, but, um, Hughes's grandmother instilled pride in him for being black and that that was a good thing. So um, it seems like through his work, he has in part kind of tried to show people his grandmother's vision of black people and not his father's, which was what was socially acceptable and what people believed at the time. Brett? Uh, so I think it's important to mention that the 1920s when uh, uh, Hughes is uh, you know, emerging, I guess would be the best way of putting it, uh, is is the time of the lost generation and uh, Hemingway and all those guys as well and, and Hughes is a part of that uh, and I, I think I, my point in all of this is that it was a time of such social change and I don't just mean through everything I mean one of the reasons why it's so amazing that he tells the story of the everyday average person is because that wasn't necessarily a story that was being told uh, you had the Victorian authors who really had gone there. Uh, with like Oliver Twist and a few things like that. Um, but before that, most stories told were about kings and exciting people and heroes. And, uh, you know, you, you left out, uh, the little guys that weren't important. And there's a flip there in the beginning of the, uh, you know, 20th century where we started to care about everybody, wanting to see the whole picture and stuff. And I think beautifully he, uh, he encapsulates a lot of that. Oh. Just a quick, quick spin. I just want to point out the time period. We're not going to focus on Harlem Renaissance because we, we want to do that another time, really. But I just want to put that when the Harlem Renaissance was 1950 to 1945 in the United States, and some of the social change was happening back then. Some of the good, some of the really, really bad, is where we took a couple steps back in America with Thatcher Reconstruction, which started out. Working out well, and then along came the Jim Crow laws and everything else that just kicked us backwards in time. And with that, go ahead, please. Oh, uh, well, that's two steps forward, one step back. There is yeah. progress, and then there is backlash. Yeah. Um, but um, Wiki was uh, saying that he like jazz poetry was just kind of becoming a thing when like yeah. some pieces writing. So mm -hmm. like, I had not heard of jazz poetry. Oh, Jazz poetry oh, emerges. Wow. You have so many like new forms of art. It's amazing. Okay. Um, Jazz poetry. Which one of these two do I want to do? You want to break it down? I don't. <laughs> you don't want to? But by the way, too, also, too, this is a time period where jazz is coming into itself, mm -hmm. too. And jazz started off being viewed by the by certain parts of society as being black music. I mean, leave it there. They actually use a racial term, which I hate. Um, but jazz ended up taking, ta just breaking out, not just in America, but breaking out, at least across all of Europe at that time, and just connecting people. So, jazz poetry. Go well, you can dance to it. Yes. You can't dance to classical music. You know. <laughs> you can Unless try. it's the waltzes. The waltzes you can. You waltz. And then you, you waltz. waltz to it and stuff. But you're not actually dancing, dancing. You know, jazz is. Okay. Oh my God. We'll, we'll, we'll argue about Sorry, that aspect later. Go ahead. Different <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so, I, to, not going into jazz poetry, but it is definitely something that I think people should look into because it is both fascinating and invigorating. It just, it just, well, yes, look into it. Jazz poetry. Research right. it. Um, but one of the things about Langston Hughes is that when you look at his poetry, 
there are, you mentioned in the quote that mm-hmm. the subject and verbs don't agree. And I'm just like, yes, yes, because this is the way we talk. This is the way normal people talk. This is the way black people talk. There are like, there are very few moments in here where I can look at a poem. I'm holding a book of Langston Hughes poetry right now that Kathleen let me borrow. And there is not a moment when I can open this book and be like, well, that sounds like my grandmother right there. Or, oh, yep, that's my daddy. That, mm-hmm. Oh, he would say that. Like, it's, it's, it's so ha- wonderfully heartening to see and to think, you know what? This is canon now. Mm-hmm. This has a place in American literature for somebody who sounds the way that my family sounds. It's, it's, it's wonderful. It just gives me such joy. Well, for a little taste of jazz poetry here, this is called Jazzonia. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Do we need to start snapping? <laughs> yes. Only if you want to. <laughs> oh, Silver Tree. Oh, shining rivers of a soul in a Harlem cabaret. Six long-headed jazzers play. A dancing girl whose eyes are bold lifts high a dress of silk and gold. Oh, singing tree, oh, shining rivers of soul, where I, where Eve's eyes in the gar, in the first garden, sorry, I just lost my place, in the first garden, just a bit too bold, was Cleopatra's, was Cleopatra gold, gorgeous, in a crown of gold. Oh, shining tree, oh, silver rivers of, of the soul, in a whirling cap array, six long headed jazzers play. Sorry for the pauses. My bad. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm good. I can't snap, so it's good you did it with two hands. <laughs> Please. I'll take that hand. I see. Mine goes to mine. You got a dovetail. Um. So, Chanel, what you were saying about like you can you can open a book of Langston Hughes poems and say this is how my dad speaks. This is how my grandmother speaks in this one. Um. One of the things that I that I like about his poetry is that it does deal with racial issues um, and it deals with biracial issues. So there's a poem in there called Cross um, that talks about having parents that are like mine. And I love it. It gives me joy. Um, Do you mind if I read it? Please. Um, I also like the titles called Cross, too. Like, it's not just out there, but immediately when you read, you realize, I see what this is. So Mm -hmm. Cross. My old man's a white old man, and my old mother's black. If ever I curse my white old man, I take my curses back. If ever I curse my black old mother and wish she were in hell, I'm sorry for that evil wish, and now I wish her well. My old man died in a fine big house. My ma died in a shack. I wonder where I'm going to die, being neither white nor black. I love that. Like, Uh um, one of the, the things that, people don't always realize about being biracial and coming from two uh, racial groups that look distinct and have distinct cultures from one another is that you don't quite fit in either group. Like it would be nice, but like you visibly stand out from both groups. So you don't have a place in either one really. And that can lead to wondering where your place actually is. So I love that that poem like deals with that. Like, yeah. Can, can we can we can we continue on with the with the fangirling over specific poems, please? Yeah, go for it. Because and just keep going. <laughs> okay, there is a poem, and I remember reading this poem from high school, and it just speaks so much to me about pride and heritage and the the things that we tell ourselves and we tell our children to keep going. And the poem is called Mother to Son. Yeah. Well, son, I'll tell you, life ain't life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor. There. But all the time I've been climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the stairs because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now, for I'm still going, honey. I'm still climbing. And life of me ain't been no crystal stair. Excellent. And I think, before I jump this over to Brad, who's waiting for the next, um, 
one of the things that you pointed out with what Langston Hughes puts into his poetry is what feeds into his ability to write about the ordinary person, his own heritage, his own pride, and so forth. And just because you're not one of those famous kings who people, other people have written about doesn't mean you don't have a certain background that's worth knowing. Mm-hmm. And with that, go for it, Brad. Okay, since y'all are fangirling over uh, poetry, hey, I'm also uh, I have to uh, <laughs> buy a fan guy. Thank you. Uh, I, fan peopling? <laughs> um, that was better. I don't understand why fangirl can't be a unisex name if mankind is unisex. Okay, fine. Is I'm a fangirl. I'm, fangirl. Girl. I'm, I'm, I'm fangirling, fangirling over his plays. Okay, this is where I originally <laughs> ran into Langston Hughes. Uh, you guys have heard about me, people have listened to this for a while. Uh, Zornia Hostin was like a huge impact to me in high school. Um, she really blew my mind and opened a lot of doors that I did not know existed. Um, when I became a playwright and wanted to get into that and found Langston Hughes and all of that kind of stuff, I came across Wool Bone, which is a play that the two of them wrote in 1931. Now, famously, this play, uh, if you've ever read it, and I've never seen it performed, and I would love to, I've only read it, um, I can only imagine how powerful it must have been. Uh, but famously, this is why I gotta bring it up. Uh, they were friends before they started writing it, and the process of writing it actually broke them up and they severed their friendship after this play, and it would not be made for 30 some odd years. Um, so it's a famous play, I always come in after all of that, but it is, it, it is incredibly powerful when you read it. Um, and it is, uh, it is, uh, I don't know, I'd, I'd have, I'd, 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 here, I'll give you the quick one. So essentially what it is, is uh, two people fighting for Daisy's affections um, and the everything that kind of goes into that. But it's the setting and everything, which is, uh, you know, obviously something that Langston and Zorniel Hurston both play with a lot. And to not play with, but talk about a lot. Um, and then the other one I have to throw out uh, is Mulatto, which uh, I also had the chance of reading, which is a, a father-son conflict, which is amazing. And then race is brought into that as well. Uh, but there are a ton. Uh, he wrote like, I don't know, 12 or something like that, plays of the course of his lifetime. And uh, it's, they're, they're all, I, I've never read, I have not read them all, I uh, wish I could, uh, but I have yet to read a bad one. And all of them have actually touched me uh, in, in various ways, uh, which to me, in, in a play is something that is amazing to be able to well, we've been talking about Langston Hughes a lot. Let's talk about ordinary people, which is what he wrote about, or rather, uh, his character Simple became a representation of. What what makes an ordinary person something to write about? Why why should now I'm playing devil's advocate, even though I know some of my own answers. Why should I care about writing about anybody, for that matter, who maybe a car salesman? I'm thinking something. Why, why should I care about um, a teacher? Why should I care about hell? Why should I care about the janitor? I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing it out. And by the way, there's one janitor who was a mentor of mine. The guy had four PhDs. Holy moly. Three of them were in science. <laughs> he was, at the time I met him, he was a janitor because he was tired of the corporate world. Langston Hughes actually it said he he quit what was it, a job or like college or something because it was taking up too much of his writing time so he became a bus boy so he could write more. Good here. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, um, I I would say that it's important to write about everyday people and about people that you see in your everyday life and people with life experiences like yours because. A, it's not ordinary to someone else necessarily. Like, people are actually curious about the life that you think is so mundane. And, uh, B, I hope I said A before and not one. You did. Um, (laughs) One and B. (laughs) B, um, representation is important. And, uh, like, you don't know how much it will mean to someone to see themselves reflected in your work because you're writing about a life experience that they share and that maybe isn't not in the literary canon because no one thought it was important enough before. Like there have been certain periods um, over history where people suddenly like as a collective 
realize that they have been silencing a group of people who will no longer be silenced, and they begin to tell their stories in ways other people hear. And um, we've lived through a few of them now. But, um, I mean, your group could be next. Might as well, you know, start things going. So no one then wow, that went dark real quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, it did. It's, 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 uh, it's no, I, I love it. My <laughs> status is always dark. Oh, uh, this is Bring true. Bring it to light, guys. Chanel and then Brad. Go for Chanel. So, with regard to why should I care, not necessarily about, like, teachers and janitors and car salesmen, because I'm sure that they're all great, and <laughs> everyone has... I like to say that no one... Everyone is extraordinary and no one is average. Because think about it in terms of mathematics. Average is really just like a combination, a culmination of these varying parts that are supposed to be able to give a general sense of a group while not actually being any one part of the group. So that may, that goes to say you can have an average, but no one is going to actually fit that average. And if you do, hell, that's pretty impressive. Um, but every person, no matter how average they are, Every person has something about them that's worth telling. And I will try to censor my language here. <laughs> I will be darned <laughs> if anybody gets to tell somebody that their story is not worth being heard. So, like, okay, they're a teacher. Maybe they're a teacher with, like, an insane eye for detail. That's not average. Maybe they're a janitor that knows 50 bajillion decimals of pi that's not average like there's always going to be something about somebody because people are multifaceted little rays of sunshine i feel really weird saying that mm-hmm. um but everyone has something that makes them special cute unicorns and rainbows and hearts see we went from a dark to a light <laughs> everybody's got something that makes them unique everybody's got some. Kathleen's wearing a unicorn shirt. There we go. That says imperfections are beautiful and a unicorn's horn has a giant crack in it. There we go. So even if it's your imperfection, that is something that's worth telling a story about. So especially with regard to, I I don't don't, want to just put this on race, but when it comes down to it, like I said, there's no one whose story isn't worth being told. Because you may think that, oh, just because this is what you see every day, this is this is the life you're used to, that it's not spectacular and no one will want to read it. No one will want to hear about it. But that's not true. It's simply not true. We've seen it time and time again. But people, especially if it's outside of their ordinary, someone will want to hear what you have to say. Brad and Kathleen? So... Ordinary people, uh, are, as characters, is, is a unique te- st- uh, storytelling device. And one of the things that I think is really beautiful about it is the ability to tell individual stories. And as we said, this it doesn't necessarily fall into race, and it doesn't necessarily fall into class standing or anything like that. Often it does, and because we often have neglected groups of people that need to be represented or need their stories told. And that's, to be honest, the job of a writer is to tell these stories. So... The whole point is to go out and find the unique and the individual and to highlight and showcase them. And the reality is, is that if there are 7 billion of us on this planet, uh, most of us are probably fairly interesting individuals. And, you know, yes, the rich and famous are often the ones that get the focus, but to be honest, they tend to have boring lives of uh, the same, you know? Uh, they've probably dicked somebody over to get their money. They've, they're having all these people come after their money. Uh, problems come in because of money. You know, whatever. Uh, when you are dealing with the ordinary, you're leaving all those normal storylines behind. And suddenly you're telling, uh, as we've talked about, much more literary tales when you're talking about, you know, no explosions or anything like that, but character developments and the ways in which we interact. One of the things I love about Langston Hughes is Yes, his characters are normal people, but the interactions that they have with each other are incredibly dynamic. And the 
relationship that is being unveiled to you is has meaning and depth and range and you know really really gripping emotions that just tear into you and these characters stay with you and that will always be a more compelling story than the guy who pushes a button and makes something blow up. Well, with Kathleen, then um, Mommy, then the girl over here to the left. Um, well, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you said, Chanel, about like your ordinary, but um, I I wanted to to go further in that like your ordinary is not everyone's ordinary. As Chanel said, it's not necessarily about race. Like, I grew up going through private schools, and, like, I mentioned this to you, Chanel, and you were like, you looked at me funny, (laughs) because, like, um, you grew up primarily in public schools, and it's a completely different experience. Right. Um, Like, um, and and that's just, you know, your school setting. Like, geographically speaking, Chanel and I have compared notes about growing up in St. Louis versus in Mississippi. Like... And it's a completely different experience than my friend had growing up in Maine. Like, completely different. And, like, we're the same social class, but completely different experiences just based on geography. And, like, I could go into having, like, culture coming from two different cultures and two distinct racial groups. And, like, growing up in a country where one of those is dominant and the other one is often unheard from. So, I mean, like, that's my ordinary. But... There are people who are curious about that because that's not their ordinary at all. Um, so, like, one of the things that I like about all the minority voices and the whole own voices hashtag stories that are coming out is I get to see other people's ordinaries. Like, um, in uh, the best science fiction and fantasy of the year, there's um, there's a short story about um, Indian warriors on the moon. Like, the the... The nation of India. Um, oh, India, India. Okay. Yes, Thanks. as opposed to Native Americans. Right. Um, but, like, it's the future, their society on the moon. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is fabulous. Like, the author didn't try and explain India to me. I just was expected to know and understand or look that up myself. And I was like, wow, like, this is so cool. Like, I got to see a different culture from their own perspective, like, but in the future. So, like, that gives me such joy. And for that particular author, it was just, you know, this is life. This is ordinary. But for me, it was new and wonderful and exciting. And I got to learn something. So, I mean, I'm really excited that we're living in a time where there are so many stories coming out like that. Like, I, I live for it. Melanie? Well, this is um, just talking about, uh, this is a little sideways topic, but I, I just recall there's a lot of if you look around and talk about your life, you'll find a lot of uh, stories about a writer's struggle. It seems like they're fictional. A lot of them are fictional autobiographies. So if you're writing <laughs> that story, then you have to be really good, because that story has been written before, but no, your version goes, of it hasn't. Yeah. As, say, as the saying goes, there's no new story in the sun. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Kathleen. Then I got Brad. Then I got Fedora. Oh, well... The writer's struggle is one example of, like, your ordinary, but I think one of the things that we've mentioned a bit in this topic is that, like, everyone's experience is unique. So, like, your experience of that struggle and the other details about your life, like, maybe you're a janitor with four PhDs and you're a struggling writer. Like, that's that's a different sort of life than someone who, you know, quit college or quit his uh, high-paying job because he would rather write and be a busboy than do all that. Then you, you would be telling like St. Hughes' story, and you would remember you forever and ever. Um, but I mean, like those are totally different experiences. So one of the things that has made me want to raise a question is like, how do you write people like you with struggles like you or experiences like you in ways that other people want to read in ways that are familiar storylines, but like with different protagonists than we've seen. Brad, you, are you dovetailing or are you changing? Uh, well, I can't dovetail it on that, but um, technically I'm, I'm still dovetailing on what was said earlier. Okay. Uh, so to answer Kathleen's question really quickly, the fastest way to do that is just to, uh, you know, 
writing is like okay. So my point is, is that writing in, in stories, like stories, are not that different. It's the people that are in the stories and the relationships that are formed that change the story around. So the reality is, is the story you're still telling is an amazing story about a character. It's just now that character is highly connected to you and an experience that you want to tell. And that's the important part to capture. But it's still probably going to be a story about like a guy and a girl or two guys, or, you know, love or hate, you know, and, and that's the beauty of storytelling. Uh, the other thing I was going to throw out real quick, let me throw it over here, is that this is encapsulated beautifully by a photo that I just saw uh, recently online uh, where a young woman was swimming with her pet tamarind, which is a, a, a type of monkey. And she was, you know, the, the house that she is swimming in front of is obviously not the best in comparison to what we would uh, say here in the first world. But my point is, is that A, she was super happy, and B, she has a pet tamarind, and I do not. <laughs> so I live in a first world country and have air conditioning and all the great lots of things, but I do not get a pet tamarind. Uh, and, you know, even I don't even think I can get one here in Missouri as, like, an exotic pet or anything like that. And she is living in a jungle and on the river and has a pet tamarind who sits on her head while she's swimming around the river. That is the way in which we look at our lives and we try and compare. And sometimes I don't think that's the best thing because there is no direct comparison. And sometimes other people's lives that you would consider to be ordinary are actually quite extraordinary. Is this a sidebar? Legal, legal disclaimer. Please check the laws in your own state <laughs> or country before you try to get yourself a pet tamarind. Exactly. Um, I think we had... Sidori, are you changing subjects? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so we're going to go with Chanel, then over to Kathleen, and then the door has been waiting so patiently. Do that. So you're gonna... uh, I just oh okay. So Kathy Chanel just granted me the floor because I think my mom had a monkey when she was in Congo, and that was normal for her. Like, but she has no monkey now, and I have never had a monkey. Like, also, awesome. that is so unfair for me. Like, two years. exactly. But like, that was normal. Like, it was normal there, and I'm like, what? Like, this was a thing. Yeah. So just you know, your ordinary can vary from place to place too. Very like, good. what's ordinary to me right now was not ordinary to me when I was living in the Northwest going to school. So your ordinary changes. So, like, keep notes on your life because you might want to use those things later. Um, in terms of writing your ordinary um, and how to get, sort of get your teeth into that because you don't think that it's, um, it's really hard to think that, I mean, I guess people can be, like, completely narcissistic and whatever and think that they're just the best thing since sliced bread. But those people? for people like me, it's hard to think that what you see and what you are is worth telling about. Mm-hmm. And one of the best ways that I have seen to try and get into that or get past that is to not be afraid to be incredibly honest and incredibly vulnerable. Because if you have to take a, if you have to be very earnest about the things that you see and the problems you see and why you feel the way that you feel about it, it's going to, it's going to ring true. And that's going to be one of the things that draws people into quote unquote a story like yours. I'm going to go ahead because we've been waiting for Fedora to change. So we're going to come back, I hope, but go ahead. I want to talk about what made Langston Hughes possible. At the end of the Civil War, Mm -hmm. many people, African Americans, particularly soldiers who were African American and just fought in the Civil War, saw the one thing that they had to do if they were going to join the larger community and tell all of these unstold stories that you have been saying were suppressed until this time. And the difference is education. In Missouri, for example, Lincoln University was created specifically by former African-American Union soldiers for African-Americans to get a good education, understanding that before and during the Civil War, education was completely forbidden. Even so simple a thing as learning to read and write. Mm -hmm. 
education was the difference. They knew it. And in Missouri, we had not only Lincoln University in Jefferson City, but there was also a Smith College, which was in Sedalia, the place where Scott Joplin came in order to study musical composition so that he could write down the music that he heard in his head. This is the beginning of it, and the, the essence, the quintessence of giving gravitas to African-American soldiers, I think, came with Paul Dunbar. Paul Dunbar was an amazing poet, really a kind of genius, who went to Howard University and got the education so that he could create poetry, which was on a par with anybody else's. And that's why I find his story and that of his wife, Alice, even though they didn't live together all that long, but both of them became really excellent writers and very prolific in their own ways. And that's what made it possible for the Harlem Renaissance to give us this entire cultural community and to keep it going well past the 1935 often cutoff era, which is, uh, you know, people didn't have money during the Depression to buy books and poetry, for goodness sake. That was taking back seat to getting bread and milk. Yeah. But still, the cultural exchange continued and grew with, for example, Gwendolyn Brooks, who won the 1950 Pulitzer Prize for a book, which is called, I forget what it's called, it's Annie something or other, but at any rate, it was a story in three parts of a Chicago girl and her past, her present, and future, which looked bright, and won the Pulitzer Prize, the first African-American to ever win a Pulitzer Prize. And it's a, a wonderful thing. I've only read excerpts from it, of course. But all of these people, uh, these are giants. And people like Langston Hughes could stand on the soldiers of Paul Dunbar, who, by the way, wrote a poem called Sympathy, which I like very much. And certainly it continues the community with my Angelus title coming straight from it, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Um, you mentioned Lincoln University. Yes. Um, so uh, Hughes' wiki page says that um, he initially began attending college in Columbia, um, at Columbia, but uh, he eventually left because of racial prejudice, and he finished university at, um, at Lincoln University. Excellent. Yeah. We were in some ways quite progressive, at least for a while in Missouri. This faded by the 1920s, unfortunately. But for a while, it had not. It rocked in the 20s. The 20s are the heyday of St. Louis's literary community. Uh, pretty much that, like, 1910 to 1930 is when St. Louis uh, was almost the hub of all literature in the United States. Hey, now, I thought the right back was. No, I'm just joking. Sorry, <laughs> no, everybody. No, we're the ones bringing it back. You got it. Thank <laughs> you. Anyway, I, I couldn't resist. Go ahead, Brad. But that is actually something that I was just about to bring up, uh, is that one of the reasons why you, you see the emergence, and not of, of Langston Hughes, because obviously he was not writing in uh, St. Louis at this time, or he ever wrote. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, the Midwest really did become a bastion for voices that were being silenced elsewhere. Uh, one of the greats is Temple Bailey, who was the highest paid female author of her time. Um, but she had troubles uh, because she was a female author. Uh, but because of that, she lived out here in St. Louis. She had a great you know, career and everything like that. Uh, but she and others really helped put uh, St. Louis on the literary map to the point where it is one of the largest gatherings of writers outside of Paris uh, at this time. In, in New York, obviously. Uh, with you know, the Harlem Renaissance and everything going on. And uh, some of the other stuff that's going on in New York around this time. But it, it's it's an amazing history uh, that St. Louis is actually a part of. Go ahead, Kathleen. Oh, um, so, um, one of the things that I like about being a writer is you can take something that is hard for you in your own life and you can turn it into something beautiful. And um, Hughes 
dealt with a lot of racial issues in his life because he was a black man in America um, at a time where it was extremely difficult to be a black man in America as opposed to just, you know, slightly less. Um, so uh, one of the things about Hughes was that he stressed a racial consciousness and cultural nationalism devoid of self-hate. And a lot of his poetry talks about those things. Like, it addresses those issues in ways that are relatable and understandable. Like, those are large issues that he... He he uses something short and small to show you a bigger picture. Um, And your issue may not be race. Your issue could be any number of things. Like, everybody has things that make their lives more difficult, but that they hopefully will embrace and recognize as being part of what makes them who they are and special. And like, you can do that with your writing. Like you don't just have to show what is easy about your life or what is good. You can show what is difficult about your life. You can show the issues that are important to you through your characters who have struggles like yours. Um, And I think people need to hear those things too. Like you don't just have to, if you're a janitor with four PhDs, talk about, you know, the topics of your PhDs or, you know, what it's like to clean up a place. You can also talk about what's important to you nationally and culturally. Like, you you are a collection of different things. They could be entirely disparate things, but all of those are part of what makes you who you are. And you don't have to pick and choose which ones to write about based on what you think is socially acceptable to talk about or people want to read about. Like, I guarantee somebody wants to hear about every one of those things that makes you who you are. Chanel and then Brad. The funny thing that you should mention that is even if you decide to write about something that's completely different than your personal struggles or the place you come from or who you are as a person, the truth will out. It's going to come through. And it's, it's, you're, it's going to be one of those things where like 25 years from now, people are going to say, Oh, well, Kathleen Kayembe, she has this influence in her writing. And you can tell in these stories, and Kathleen's going to be like, what? <laughs> I, I, I did what? It, 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 the truth will always out, particularly when it comes to your upbringing. You're, it's, don't try and fight it. Just embrace it. Some related to that. <laughs> so, like, for speculative fiction writers, like, I write speculative fiction. And the, the stories that I've had published are all speculative in some way. But, like, the, the things that I published under my own name aren't about biracial people, but they definitely encompass the biracial experience. And, like, I couldn't have told you that when I wrote them. I couldn't have told you that after I sent them out. It's just having looked at them together, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, this is totally being biracial stories. Like, wow. Oh, God. I didn't realize I was putting that out there. Like, I write about a bunch about families and about the biracial experience. And clearly... I have some issues about those things because I'm trying to work them out in stories. The stories don't have to be about those things, but like what matters most to you will come out in your work. Like even when you don't mean for it to, so you might as well just embrace it. Call it a day. Before I toss it over to, (laughs) before I toss it over to Brad, you know, the spirits of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung are just sitting there going, Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. (laughs) So anyway, over to you, Brad. Exactly. Uh, No, actually, Kathleen's entirely correct about that. You're, Things will pop out, and you can do it intentionally, uh, like I'm doing with one of my books right now, where I'm intentionally exploring my own history and, you know, all of that kind of stuff and the crap of my life. Uh, or you can do it subtly, where you put it in, and it's not the B to the A story, but it's like the C story that I'm going through, and you get to explore it in a, in a way that no one in your family knows you're exploring. <laughs> uh, but one of the things I actually wanted to throw out, and this is what I want to say about uh, uh, Langston Hughes, is that one of the things I find fascinating, because it's something that's been starting to emerge in the 20s, but obviously it's seemed incredibly suppressed, and by the time he's really in writing, uh, most of it is, is not something that's supposed to be talked about, but those are also your LGBTQ issues. Um, he'll touch on them. Other writers from this era will touch on them, famously uh, Tennessee Williams as well. But they are themes that are expressed, and they are not themes that were popular in the day. Uh, and he almost seems to gravitate towards that, towards things that are being suppressed or hidden or not talked about. 
and he very much wants to shine a light on them. And it's something that some of the great writers of this time really end up doing. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating. Anyway, I'm going to close out Kathleen, and then I'm going to have Chanel close us out with a poem from my previous. Uh, Brad, I'm glad that you <coughs> that you mentioned themes because we we've, we've talked a lot about like characters whose lives reflect your life. We've talked about like storylines a bit that reflect your life, but themes is something else that you can write that reflects your life. Like like I mentioned, I write speculative fiction, so the characters and the settings that I'm writing about aren't familiar to a modern day person because they don't exist. But like the themes that are important to me can shine through in those stories anyway. Like there are ways, there are ways of being authentic to your own experience in, in stories that do not outwardly appear to be about things that we know. So, I mean, you can write about what's important to you in any genre. It doesn't have to map one to one. This person, in my experience, it can, you can do it through theme. And with that, go ahead if you would, please. And, all right. We'll end it after this poll. Okay, so I'm going to close this out with I, Too by Langston Hughes. I, too, sing America. I am the darker brother. They 